So now I would like to invite Dr. Ramamani to challenge us to think differently about the task before us. Dr. Ramamani is the co-founder of Rising Women, Rising World, a community of women that aim to pioneer a better future. As a counselor with the World Future Council, she helps to identify policy solutions to climate change to protect the rights of future generations. She serves on the jury of the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. She addresses critical global issues through her creative performances to foster innovative policy dialogue. She's a peace builder, poet, and performer, and today she'll grace us with a performance specifically designed for our forum. I'm here to honor you, each one of you, uh, for, and as well as each one of your colleagues, the thousands of people that you work with in your organizations, at every level, in your countries, at local level, regional level, national level, and global level. And in particular, there are three characteristics of the way in which you approach your work in environmental emergencies that you may find just normal, just part of a day's work, but which I find truly remarkable and worth highlighting and emulating in all other sectors. The first one is, in this era of dramatic climate change, there's also a climate of short-termism, of quick solutions, quick fixes, grabbing low-hanging fruit, of short attention spans. But you come to every single issue with the long-term view. As we've just heard from Jan Egelen, you work not just as soon as the alarm bells ring, rushing in to respond appropriately, but you're working far beyond that before the situation erupts on preparedness and after the situation has erupted in rebuilding resilience. So this long-term view is so critical for the world we live in today. The second one is what you bring is synergy. You work from all the way from the local level to the national level to the international level, building on the synergies of working across sectors and across levels. And this is fundamental for your success. And that's what you do time in and time out. But I think the most important, which make the other two so relevant, are the human qualities that you bring to your work day after day, night after night, because we know how emergencies tend to happen, mainly in the middle of the night, just before Christmas, or just before an important holiday. And you are there with these human qualities time and again. The first one is creativity. Because we know now, with the fragility of the Earth, that every environmental emergency is partly or wholly unprecedented. So however experienced you are, how many ever disasters you've seen, this is new. And you don't despair, you just roll up your sleeves, take out yet another new thinking cap, and find the creative, innovative solution that's going to work over here. The second one is your courage. Already a disaster is bad enough, but in an environmental emergency, there is the unknown and the invisible. There are all the things that could happen, the leaks of dangerous materials, the toxic waste of radiation that affects your health now, as well as in the long term. And while every living being is running away, you go in to those situations. But the third and most important, the defining part of your work is compassion. And you combine two kinds of compassion which are fundamental for the survival of our life on Earth. Compassion for fellow beings and compassion for the Earth itself which sustains us. So what, for what you do day in and day out, every day of the year, around the world, in countries far flung, to honor that, I would like to just bring this to life by focusing on one situation of the many you work on, which is Syria. And I'll do it in the way that I enjoy most, which is through storytelling. Hello, I'm James Lemazurier from the United Kingdom. 
You know, I thought I could deal with any crisis that came my way. After all, I'd been deployed in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Iraq, the Middle East. I'd been sent to Aceh the moment the tsunami burst out. I'd built terror-proof and disaster-resistant installations in the Gulf. I'd even worked for a security company that did emergency relief work. But when the barrel bombs started falling in Syria, when our Syrian colleagues started telling us what they were like, I was dumbfounded. You know, we are used to dealing with disasters one at a time. But imagine this. One barrel bomb is an earthquake of 7.6 on the Richter scale. Imagine 57 every day. What do you do with that? Then someone told me to go to see Akut, you know, the Turkish earthquake response unit. When we started talking, light bulbs went on. We knew we couldn't just bring in an earthquake rescue in the middle of a war zone, but we could design something different. So we brought together a team of volunteers from Syria, from different parts, and earthquake experts, and we had a design lab. We tore the rule book apart and put it all together again and we organized the first search and rescue training lab. We brought 25 volunteers from Aleppo. They were just ordinary guys, taxi drivers, plumbers, bakers. They'd never done humanitarian work before. But when we started the training, they were hooked. They went back with one week of training and a little backpack with some supplies. In 24 hours, we got a thank you message from them we had a photograph of the first family they'd saved from a barrel bomb. We knew we were on to something. We set up Mayday Rescue here to coordinate and collect international aid and supplies and to provide regular training and coordination. But the real work was done by them. They have set up 105 Syrian civil defense units. We call them the White Helmets. They are now 12,500 volunteers all over Syria. 220,000 people have been killed, but they've already saved 18,000. But just remember this, 57 earthquakes every day for 1,555 days and still counting. Salam. I am Abdel Malik. I served in the National Fire Service of Syria. But when the revolution started, I saw that when the opposition forces took a town, the regime would cut off all the supplies, water, electricity, fuel, food. I did not agree, so I deserted. I could see that with the bombs falling, people needed my help. So I got some volunteers and taught them everything I know, and we set up a small fire service. When we heard of the White Helmets, the Syrian civil defense units, we joined hands with them. We also received training in Turkey. We set up fire services in every part of Syria. When we are not rushing to save people from the bombs, we help our communities. We clear the rubble from the streets. We try to reconnect the lines to provide some services. We rebuild the roads. We try to build up the strength of our people before the next bombing. One day there was heavy shelling, so I told my team, you wait, I will go and check the situation. But a bomb exploded just in front of me. You know, it was the civilians I had gone to save who dragged me to safety. By the time I reached a field hospital, I had bled too much. They had to amputate my leg, here, above the knee. When my team came to see me, I said, do not despair, do not stop the work you are doing. They said, don't worry, nothing will make us stop. 
But when they left me, I wept. I thought I would never be able to help my people again. But I was lucky. Our international friends helped us, and they got me this artificial leg. The day that I could walk again, I reported back to service. You see, we are all of different backgrounds and religions, but we all have one motto, and it is also written in the Quran. If you save one human life, it's as if you have saved all humanity. I'm Bhima from Darra. This is where our peaceful revolution started. When the soldiers first came to shoot us, we gave them olive branches to tell them that all we want is peace and freedom. We didn't plan to be humanitarians, me and my friends. It just happened when the bombing started. I remember that first day when the barrel bomb started. I was walking in a narrow street when we heard the sound. Someone screamed, lie down, lie down, and people fell flat on the ground, and people started to pray. I froze. I saw the planes dropping the bombs. I saw they destroyed everything, everything, everything. But we didn't sit still and wait for help when the bombing started. We knew that the humanitarian workers from abroad wouldn't be able to come into the liberated areas. So we came forward to help in whatever way we could. My friend, Jihad, he set up the Syrian Defense Unit here in Dara. I helped him. I took two first aid classes so I could join the field hospital as a volunteer. My area was captured by the regime, so I would cross the front line every day to reach the hospital. It was very dangerous, but nothing could make me stop, because our people need so much help. Every day, new civic organizations are set up to help people. We don't work separately. We all work together, because we all have just one goal, and because we know that everything is interconnected. We all are interconnected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck. Mm -hmm.